I'd like to begin by addressing the white elephant that enters the room anytime someone talks about bees. This would be the bee movie. <laughs> In case you aren't familiar, this 2007 film depicts the life of a bee who falls in love with a human and, quote, as their relationship blossoms, discovers that humans actually eat honey and subsequently decides to sue them. So, I'd like to debunk a few of the misconceptions that this movie could create. One, bees, in case you did not know, cannot talk to humans. As a result, two, they cannot fall in love with humans. And three, beekeepers are not the bad guys. You see, this movie depicts beekeepers as these ominous people who enslave the bees and steal from them, when in fact, this couldn't be more wrong. Beekeepers are their biggest supporter, and right now, they need all the help they can get. Now, in my freshman year of high school, I got involved with beekeeping through a classroom. Now, I had been looking for a project for my environmental science class and had always known some beekeepers as family friends. My beekeeping knowledge didn't extend past what I'd seen in the bee movie, so I asked for them to get me started. Ever since, I've had hives in my backyard. Now, most people ask, well, what do you do? You know, how does one keep bees? So I think a good start is being able to identify a honeybee. So first up, on the left here, you have a common honeybee. Then you have a bumblebee and a yellow jacket. Right off the bat, we have differences in appearance in terms of size, color, and fur. Now, most people look at these and they think stinging. But in fact, they all behave quite differently. Now, honeybees are generally very docile creatures, and it's not in their best interest to sting you. When they do, their barbed stingers are ripped from their bodies and they die as a result. Therefore, they only use stinging as a last resort. The other two don't have barbed stingers, and in fact, yellow jackets are much, much more aggressive. Now, even amongst the hives, we have three different types of bees. You have the worker bee, a drone, and the queen. Now, worker bees are female bees that don't have the ability to produce a fertilized egg. In her short time of about four to six weeks, the worker bee is the powerhouse of the hive. She has a number of jobs to complete, including the collection of pollen and nectar, the creation of honey and beeswax, and protecting the hive. Now, unlike what we see in the bee movie, where bees were assigned to one job to complete their entire life, as a female worker bee gets older, her jobs progress through the hive, and she starts completing different tasks. Next, we have the drone. Drones are male bees, and their purpose is to leave the hive in search of a virgin queen to mate with, therefore extending the genetic diversity of their colony. If they do so, they die. If not, they return to the hive and are later evicted for the winter. Now finally, and notably the most well-known of the three is the queen bee. Oh, <laughs> not that one. Now, the queen bee, there will only be one of which in each colony. As you can see here, the queen is often two and a half times the size of your average worker bee. Early on in her life, a queen will leave the hive in search of a group of drones to mate with, and then will return to start her colony, never having to mate again during her four to six years in life, because she can store that sperm for her entire life. Now, her role within the hive is to then lay eggs, essentially choosing when to lay a fertilized egg resulting in a worker bee, or an unfertilized egg resulting in a drone. So, where do beekeepers fit into all of this? Well, first and foremost, the role of a beekeeper is not to steal from the hive. The relationship is in fact symbiotic, one where beekeepers work year round to ensure the overall hive health for these bees, and as a result, they get to collect surplus at the end of the year. So, bees store their honey in honeycomb, which they then cap with beeswax so that it doesn't ferment. Therefore, what beekeepers do is they'll remove the frames that have capped honey and replace them with new frames. They then remove the beeswax caps and put these frames in a large centrifuge, which extracts the honey, which can then be bottled and used later. This beeswax can also be melted down and used for things like candles. 
lip balms, or soap. Now, beekeepers also do a lot more than just extract honey. Like I said, throughout the year, they're constantly looking for signs of disease and pests and maintaining the overall health. And they also come in handy during a swarm. Now, how many times have we seen images like this one where in movies or in cartoons, you have a cloud of bees chasing after your character in revenge for honey? Well, in reality, a swarm is much, much more practical. Swarms are a natural phenomenon in colony reproduction. What happens is the worker bees essentially create a new queen so that she can leave and start her own colony. When she does so, the queen can often take up to 60% of the worker bees with her, meaning thousands upon thousands of bees leaving the hive at once, which can look quite alarming. Now, in the days leading up to this mass exodus, scouts are sent out into the surrounding area to look for potential places to host this new hive. This could take the form of, say, a hollowed out tree, or even a hole in the railing on your porch, thus leading to the fear. If you look here, you'll see a hive that had swarmed in my backyard. It created a very, very large clump around a small sapling in a tree. Luckily, we were able to collect the swarm and put them in a new hive to start their colony. So what's the purpose of all of this? What's the point? You know, we often hear the phrase, save the bees, but what does that mean? Today, the global populations of honeybees are declining at an alarming rate, and this is something that affects every single one of us. Now you see, honeybees provide a plethora of economic and environmental advantages to our planet through pollination. It's estimated that over a third of all food grown on this planet is pollinated by honeybees. This means that without this pollination, you can say goodbye to things like watermelons, apples, cashews, and even coffee. So in order to fix this, we are going to need to see more of an improvement in social campaigns like the Save the Bees campaign, coupled with legislation. Now fortunately, we've begun to see this on a national level. Former President Obama put in place a presidential memorandum that started a national pollinator task force under the EPA and the Department of Agriculture. This task force has goals in increasing the global populations of honeybees and pollinators like them, doing so with action steps, including pesticide control or land management. And it also increases research into the different factors that are affecting the population loss, like pesticide use, disease, and climate change. Now, in order for things like this to be effective, we not only need to see it on a national scale, but just as important is the grassroots activism that we see happening in cities all over the world. So let's look at Durham. Three years ago, honeybees were included in the local city ordinance under livestock. The ordinance stated that any citizen could have as much livestock as they wanted, as long as it stayed on their property. Now, because bees pollinate for miles beyond their hive, you can see how this became problematic for beekeepers. So one woman named Donna Devaney set out to change this. Donna started attending the city council meetings and petitioning the city council with other members of the community. She even founded the Durham County Beekeepers Association to assist with this. And after a year, her hard work paid off. So whether it's national legislation or a local beekeeping organization, community support is vital. It's vital to the longevity of the honeybee. Even here in Durham, we have resources available for community members to get involved. The Durham County Beekeepers Association hosts open hive events every month, and they have monthly meetings for community members to come and learn about these processes. They even teach beekeeping classes twice a year. If you find a hive that has swarmed in your backyard, you can give them a call and they'll send someone out to safely, quickly, and efficiently remove that swarm from your backyard. It's little of things like this that make the difference for everyone. So if you want to help, you can attend the meetings. If you can't attend the meetings, then take a tour at the Burt's Bees factory here in Durham. If you can't do that, then buy your honey locally and support your local beekeeper. You see, I'm not asking all of you to leave here and start a hive in your backyard. If you want to do that, that's fantastic. Please see me during the intermission. But what I do want is for you to be aware of this problem. 
You see, this is something that affects every single one of us. On social media today, we're seeing an increase in stories where drones are be cre being created to replace honeybees and other pollinators when they go extinct. I find this to be an extremely sad story. So if you enjoy your morning cup of coffee or like a slice of apple pie, this affects you. Like I said before, it affects every single one of you. So I don't think it's too late for this story to have a happy ending. So let's change the narrative. Thank you.